Hi, and welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sebastian Couture, and I'm here with Frédéric Ernst. Today, we're speaking with Vasily Shapovalov. He's the CTO of P2P Validator and the co-founder of LidoDAO. Before we talk to Vasily, though, about Lido and uh, all things staking, we'd like to tell you about our sponsor this week. Gnosis Safe is a smart wallet for securely managing digital assets. What makes Gnosis Safe different is that it allows you to define customized access permissions. So Gnosis Safe enables users to control digital assets with granular permission uh, involving multiple private keys, uh, a subset of which is required to execute a transaction. These keys can then be stored on different hardware or software wallets or even shared across multiple people. Gnosis Safe's extra layer of security and personalization makes it the most trusted uh, Web3 asset management solution for individuals, teams, and DAOs who already use it to store more than $80 billion worth of digital assets today. On top of that, Gnosis Safe also provides opportunities for developers to plug into the platform and build their own dApps and permissionless modules. Uh, visit gnosis-safe.io to learn more and to get started with your own safe. And I think Frederica, you had a brief update about Gnosis Safe you want to share with us. Oh yeah, I just wanted to um, say that uh, Gnosis Safe is now live on several um, side chains. So it's on XDAI, on Polygon, on Energy Web Chain, on Volta, and on Binance Smart Chain. So you can just toggle between those uh, if you're so inclined. Cool. So all of the uh, EVM chains, I guess. Great. So uh, thanks, Frederica and Vasily. Thanks for joining us today. Hey. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. So before we get started, uh, tell us a bit about your background and how you got involved into crypto. I come from a software engineering background. I used to be a software engineer in uh, uh, in field information security in Russia, and then I became an engineering manager. And uh, in uh, 2017, uh, uh, I just got sucked into crypto part time first. Then uh, in I think in 2019 full time and 2020 I became a CTO of P2P. What does P2P do? Uh, we're a professional node operator. We we run uh, uh, nodes validators for multiple blockchains and blockchain protocols. Um, that's cool. essentially what we do. Like uh, like many uh, validators, we are uh, uh, also active in communities and participate in governance. So. That's part of what we do as this well. This is why yeah. we're talking about Lido today, right? Yeah. So basically, you're here to talk about um, Lido and your role in Lido and to explain to us how Lido works. So t t tell us um, how you got involved with Lido. Um, so I, I started working uh, in P2P in February 2020. And in uh, March 2020, basically, the second thing I did after I just like got uh, uh, acquainted with the team I wrote a like a, a first draft of what what Lido would be. Why? Because uh, when um, when I took a look at the staking landscape, I realized that the most important uh, event of 2020 for node operators for for all the staking uh, ecosystem will be uh, finally the launch of proof of stake uh, version of Ethereum, uh, the Beacon Chain, and it was extremely likely that it would launch in 2020. Um, which people uh, started to adopt this point, uh, but like I, I was sure that uh, it will happen, and it did in in December. So, uh, and I took a look at how the staking in, in Ethereum uh, is made. There is no delegation in protocol, and I understood that there is no place for professional node operators in Ethereum. Like it, it, it's not like there is absolutely no place, but it's very hard to attract clients and work with them. Uh, uh, it requires paperwork and legal agreements and uh, uh, like B two B marketing and all the stuff that is pretty cumbersome for not operator operators. And uh, I took a look at uh, uh, staking protocols, of which there was only a Rocket Pool uh, building at this time. Uh, they are really OG in staking protocols, and it also wasn't like really great for not operators because it. Uh, require them to have uh, a significant self bond and rocket pool tokens which is uh, like not very capital efficient for for not operators so i tried to design a, a staking protocol that would be 
uh, would work well for users, for not operators, and for Ethereum itself. Uh, hence, uh, the draft, the first draft of LIDO. Okay, before we dive into this, can you maybe explain um, in a nutshell how ETH staking works? So basically, what are the requirements for stakers um, and what is it difficult to, to meet these or why is it difficult to meet these? Uh, Ethereum staking protocol is a technical marvel. It's, it's very well designed from a technical uh, point of view. It allows uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of individual validators to participate in staking. Uh, the way it does this, uh, it allows uh, a validator, uh, which is essentially in this context is a validating key, to sign an attestation or to propose a block. And uh, uh, this attestation are aggregated in uh, in an aggregated signature, BLS signature, uh, in a very efficient manner. So there can be a lot of uh, a lot of nodes in the network uh, potentially. But to run one single validator, you first first of all you need uh, thirty two adders, uh, which is uh, pretty expensive. And second, you need to run uh, a node. You need to run a uh, Bitcoin chain client node, and you need to run a validator node. There are Penalties for uh, for your node being offline, and there are pretty 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 serious slashings for your node being uh, uh, equivocating. For for example, if you run uh, accidentally run uh, two nodes with the same private key at once, uh, Ethereum uh, running a, a single validator client on Ethereum is not very hard. It's not uh, it's not as challenging as some other blockchain protocols. But it's still uh, to 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 run an Ethereum node, you need to run a uh, full, 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 uh, like 90, 95 percent uptime uh, service in the internet. You need to uh, check health to upgrade to the newest client versions, and uh, you get penalized if you don't do this. Mm -hmm. So, for most people, uh, there are like there are two barriers to running a validator node. It's one one barrier is having thirty two ETH, and the other bar is uh, barrier is having enough technical chops to uh, to actually uh, run a node, which is not very hard, but it's not very easy either, and it's uh, unpredictable, uh, pretty much unpredictable uh, workload on you. You, you might, might, might be like uh, pull it off your vacation to uh, to restart a node or something like that, uh, which is why most people don't do this. Uh, most people don't don't do don't don't run blockchain nodes. These are uh, the, 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 this is a professional activity. So how different is it from, uh, say, other blockchains? I think like other, other our, our listeners will be familiar with like staking on Cosmos or perhaps like Solana and other proof of stake blockchains. What's the what's the fundamental difference here? Because it, it feels to me like the main difference is primarily the fact that we don't have staking de delegations built in. Um, but there are, are there other things that are like kind of fundamentally different? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I was getting to. The the the, the real difference between. Uh, Ethereum and uh, in and uh, uh, say Cosmos or Polkadot is mostly there is no native delegation protocol. Uh, most modern uh, staking protocol they they have delegation protocol because they acknowledge that uh, most people don't run their own nodes and they they can't do that, but they they own some capital and people who who, uh, who own like a lot of. Uh, uh, a, a lot of some coin. They don't want to uh, to do a complex technical task of uh, running a node. They want they like they uh, money graph to go up and to the right, and uh, uh, running node that's not for them. So um, Ethereum doesn't. Uh, there there is no delegation. That's the by design uh, that there is no delegation protocol. And what's what's the rationale behind there not being a delegation protocol? Um, so it's uh, it's it's a number of uh, of reasons. Uh, the main the, the 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 gist of it and the main vector uh, of uh, all of this boils down to that uh, Ethereum is well optimized to run uh, to to have at least a few small stakers uh, run their own nodes. So the uh, while uh, Cosmos or Polkadot were optimized to have as much stake as possible, basically. 
well, Polkadot not, not really it it, 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 uh, it targets about fifty percent in staking, but like Cosmos is optimized to have as much uh, in staking as possible. Ethereum is optimizing to, to 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 the ease of use for a small small time validator, which like with uh, operational requirements and capital requirements, the small time validator is actually not a very small time really. It, mm, it requires, but so Ethereum yeah. is is a is is optimized for decentralization. I guess is one way to look at That's, it. That's uh, optimized for on as how, many nodes as possible. How you measure decentralization? So, like, uh, what 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 do you mean by decentralization? Uh, it it doesn't optimize for decentralization of uh, of stake concentration at all. For example, the the way it's designed is actually pushing people to stake in pools and uh, first of them like custodial stake in pools like exchanges and stuff. Uh, but it makes if you if you are really uh, really want you to run your own node, you uh, that would be uh, participate in consensus. You can do it is e more easily on Ethereum than on Cosmos. On Cosmos, you'll have to fit into like 150 or I, I don't remember 20 to 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 200 uh, uh, node operators by stake. And on Ethereum, you only need like. This uh, ninety thousand dollars to run a node operator, which is like ninety thousand dollars, is not is not a small amount, right? Uh, but uh, it's not uh, it's not millions at least. Uh, so it's really well, uh, really uh, makes easy for you if you uh, makes easy for for a node operator to to get into into a validator set. Uh, but it doesn't make it easy for to to distribute the stake equally. The the way there is no delegation means uh, and the validation is hard, and uh, that means that people will uh, uh, who want to stake they will uh, basically they will need to trust protocols and um, custodial uh, providers that can take their money and stake it basically. Okay, so in terms of um, staking providers and I will call them staking assisters. Um, can you describe the spectrum of possible solutions from a technological point of view? Mm, I don't quite understand the question. Uh, okay, yeah. so basically, I mean, at the very, at the very um, trusted end of the spectrum, yeah. obviously, I could just give someone my ETH, uh, like a centralized exchange, and they would stake it for me and give me uh, most or all of the rewards, yeah. right? Um, but um, then. Uh, if if you look on the decentralization spectrum, you could have something that is non-custodial but, tr but trustful, and then you could have a solution that is non-custodial and trustless, and so on. Yeah. So ca can you kind of give us an overview of what's in principle possible? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I actually gave, gave, gave a talk about, uh, about this on uh, Ethereum community conference in Paris uh, recently. So... Uh, if anyone wants to what dive in, there is uh, uh, this talk available. But it boils down to to a few parameters that that are uh, that can be uh, chosen. Like uh, first of all, it's it can the stake in Ethereum can be custodial and non-custodial. Uh, you 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 can uh, um, still still have uh, your your keys to to at least uh, the ability to withdraw uh, your stake back when uh, the staking is finished. Or you can give it up, uh, for example, with exchanges. Uh, it can be fully custodial or uh, different degrees of uh, non-custodial. It uh, can be done natively in protocol, like Rido, Lido and Rocket Pool do it. Or it can be uh, implemented as uh, outside of the protocol, like on staking on exchanges or staking with uh, using a threshold signature protocols. Um, I don't. Uh, I think uh, uh, Steffi is doing that, uh, and to an extent, Anchor. Um, so uh, there are a, a, a few other. The staking can be liquid or liquid, and uh, uh, there are a few other parameters. But it boils down to that uh, to the fact that uh, we believe in Lido that like the liquid, the staking should be liquid because there is no way around this. Uh, liquid staking just much better product, and liquid staking will win. And if there is no liquid staking on uh, in uh, native liquid staking in Ethereum protocol, then uh, the flavor of liquid staking that will win will be like custodial one, which already exists and is pretty popular. Um, can, can you can you explain what you mean by liquid staking? Mm -hmm. Liquid staking means that you uh, uh, when 
when you stake, you get basically a voucher of your stake, uh, of your staking position, and you can transfer it. So uh, usually the, the regular staking mechanism, like in Cosmos, in in Polkadot, and Ethereum, they don't 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 do liquid staking. They uh, they lock you. So in a way, yeah. my claim is is um, locked. Whereas uh, with Lido, um, I actually I get a fungible token in exchange for my locked ETH. Uh, namely staked ETH, right? Yes, yes. In LIDAR, you get fungible token. There are multiple flavors of liquid staking. Uh, not all of them uh, give out uh, fungible tokens. There are, for example, the form of liquid staking that is called delegation vouchers that give you a non-fungible position that uh, uh, designates who you stake with, with what node operator, and uh, what's what's your total rewards by this point, like a non-fungible position staking. But it's also liquid because you can sell this NFT uh, or transfer or give it uh, as a uh, as a present, I guess. Uh, but at LIDAR, we we went for full on uh, liquid fungible as much as liquid as possible staking. So uh, when you stake with LIDAR, you get a staked ETH token that represents your staked uh, the, your, the amount of ETH staked in LIDAR and is fully fungible, fully transmittable, and uh, can participate in uh, in DeFi protocols, in centralized finances, if need be, uh, uh, be, be, be stored on uh, on wallets, uh, on uh, uh, in custodies and uh, stuff like that. So, so let's just to summarize the way that I I kind of see LIDAR is. Lido solves the problem. Well, it solves two two main problems, and then you know has some some advantages. So one is the uh, requirements, the technical requirements, in order to host a node, uh, an Ethereum node for staking, and also the capital requirement of thirty two ETH. So with Lido, you can forego that technical requirement because you're sort of delegating your stake to a staking provider, and you can stake any amount of ETH that you wish. So you know under thirty two ETH or above. And what you'll get is you'll get a, um, a a token that is liquid and fungible, and that represents that ETH that you can then use to do whatever you like, whether it's trade it for you know Dai or you know it, participate in DeFi or whatever. It's a, it's a, it's a liquid token that you can use uh, in decentralized finance. Um, so when uh, I would put it like we we solve uh, uh, for 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 users we solve uh, three. Uh, problems that uh, uh, are not possible with base Ethereum stake. One is easy delegation. It's uh, there is no native delegation in uh, in Ethereum, so uh, uh, it is possible to have someone uh, stake for you while maintaining the custody of the funds uh, using uh, different keys for uh, for staking and for withdrawals. Um, but it's uh, uh, it requires uh, it's not a protocol. You, it requires paperwork and uh, agreements and stuff like that. So it's it's not achieve, uh, It's not possible for most people and uh, to, to to have a large position and it's uh, like cumbersome. So one position is uh, ability to delegate, which is uh, w- there is no uh, such ability in native Ethereum protocol. So we solve that. The second is capital requirements and. The third is is liquidity. All three are very important because, like, we solve capital requirements for uh, most of our clients by numbers, but not uh, most of our staked ETH. Like, I think eighty uh, percent of uh, maybe more of staked ETH uh, they they don't have a problem with staking thirty two ETH. They 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 are they have much bigger positions. And Vasily, what do you mean by liquidity? Is that currently, if I deposit ETH into the ETH two contract, it's a one way street, right? There's no way to actually get it back out in for a long uh, time. ETH yeah, one. for for, for yeah. a long time. It was it wasn't clear at all at the start when when Lido launched when Ethereum Beacon Chain launched. Uh, how much time will we wa- will we wait until withdrawals are implemented? It's more clear now, but it's still uh, not soon. Uh, it's probably uh, like mid 2020 uh, 2022 or something like that and uh, uh, that means that your 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 money is held hostage by by ethereum basically and if you if you stake uh, with a native protocol and so, uh, for for some people it's okay but for many people they they want to have at least some measure of liquidity for their staking positions yeah, I mean, that makes total sense. So maybe let's talk about um, how the peg between ETH and staked ETH is maintained. 
uh, because, you know, inherently it's a one way street. So basically, if someone wants out, you need someone else to take their position. And uh, so basically, what's how much percent does it currently cost to get someone uh, to take a locked up ETH uh, until it's movable again on, on ETH too? Um, so... Um... That very much depends on uh, on the way uh, on on the staking uh, basically protocol used uh, uh, because uh, for Lido currently uh, uh, staked ETH to ETH pack is held very well. It's more than uh, uh, 0.99 staked ETH to one ETH, like a bit cheaper than ETH. And uh, uh, for other protocols, it's not so clear cut. Some some maintain the discounts of twenty percent, fifteen percent, five percent, depending on the protocol. Um, it basically boils down to uh, perception of risk, and this perception perception is really nuanced. For example, there is a perception of uh, risk of the, uh, the 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 fact that this staked Ethereum will not get uh, like withdrawn by the protocol you you not fully trust. There is also uh, missed opportunity risks. Like, for example, Ethereum is pretty productive asset right now in in DeFi ecosystem. You can like uh, lock it in Maker, have some Dai and farm on uh, liquidity farm on uh, on Dai and get some not not a lot, but like a few a few percent of APR probably. Uh, so when you have your Ethereum locked in staking, you miss out on this. Uh, these opportunities and sometimes they are very lo lucrative. Like we see this in um, when we are monitoring our liquidity pools in 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 Curve, and uh, there are weeks when people withdraw like three hundred thousand ETH to liquidity farm on Arbitrum, for example. <laughs> that was <laughs> uh, very interesting to see. Uh, Vasily, let's talk about um, what to do with staked ETH in a bit. But let me let me ask about the peg again. Yeah. So basically, say I'm I'm a staked ether whale, and I withdraw enough to actually move the peg. So basically, um, now the peg is no longer point. I mean, obviously, the peg should never be above one because then it would just make sense to uh, uh, to put put. I mean, I mean that. That should never happen, but basically say it goes from 0.99 to uh, 0.97. Um, is is the pack solely maintained by other people then buying in at a 3% discount? Uh, we have um, a fairly uh, big liquidity mining position, uh, the, the liquidity uh, mining uh, rewards program for uh, stake this to ETH pair. So... Uh, staked ETH is is a pretty good uh, way to utilize your Ethereum. So how does it work uh, currently? Um, we we've had two two uh, two months like this when the pack dropped uh, below ninety eight percent. One was in March. One was in uh, just like a month ago or so. What happens is yes, people start buying uh, staked ETH with discount and. Uh, uh, they generally buy up to about 99% discount and then it slowly close back when people deposit more ETH into Curve Pool because it's uh, uh, it's something that they see as a good way to earn some uh, some rewards on uh, staking rewards and uh, uh, yield farming rewards on top of the, uh, their ETH. So it, it it happens exactly like this. We we get sometimes drops in uh in pack and it gets better uh up to like about 99 percent pretty uh, pretty soon and then slowly crawls back to uh uh almost one to one pack so so basically incentivized market mechan mechanics uh and and people actually buying the deep so this this both makes sense uh this both are the factors here Okay, cool. Um, so, so let's talk about um, the staked ETH. Yeah. Um, so this is a fungible token that can also be used for yield farming, thus um, meaning that people who um, partake in ETH2 staking don't have the opportunity cost of um, not partaking in DeFi anymore. So tell us about what you can do in principle with, with um, staked ETH. Right now, with staked ETH, you can uh, uh, you can use it as a as a as a trading pair in DeFi. Uh, just when you uh, want to uh, move your um, 
uh, like um, significant part of your portfolio to to ETH, you can move it to staked ETH instead. Uh, that uh, through the uh, very liquid uh, curve pool and balancer pool, and uh, uh, also we have a um, pretty liquid pass of to die on uh, Susha and one inch. Um, you can do it uh, with uh, like pretty pretty low slippage, and if you intend to stand in your Ethereum position uh, for for some time, it's a good trade. Like uh, to, to use stake it in, instead of uh, Ethereum because you will earn uh, staking rewards while you stay in the position. Uh, you can use it to farm the liquidity mining on on these pools. These are all incentivized, and that's how most people use it right now. Um, you can use it as a collateral in uh, a number of uh, uh, protocols that deals with lending on money markets. Right now, it's I think uh, Anchor on Anchor on Terra, Anchor on Ethereum. Those are two different Anchor protocols, uh, called the same but like they are different. Uh, and uh, it's Inverse Finance uh, Anchor um, in uh, one of the Fuse pools. Uh, very capital fuse, and I think it should be pretty soon in Maker and uh, uh, Aave, but that's like up to them. That's governance decision that is not ha hasn't been passed yet. Uh, just we prepared a lot of uh, material for them to uh, make this decision. Yeah, and these governance processes they typically um, they take time, right? Yeah. Um, so. Um, can, can you talk uh, talk about how Lido actually makes money? Do you take fees um, out of the out of the staking rewards? Yes, we, we uh, Lido takes ten percent fee out of staking rewards, and five percent, like half of this fee, five uh, uh, percent of total staking rewards is distributed between node operators for Lido, so they're uh, they're getting paid for their service. There are a lot of node operators for Lido right now. It's fourteen, and I think we'll. Uh, that's that's on Ethereum. Lido is not only uh, staking on Ethereum. Uh, I'm I'm talking about Ethereum mostly right now. Uh, so uh, on Ethereum we have 14 node operators, and I think we'll have another round of onboarding new node operators in October or early November. Um, so we have more staking decentralization. F 14 node operators doesn't doesn't seem like a whole lot if it's, if you compare it to say like. You know, Cosmos with a hundred over a hundred and, and Solana. That why why fourteen and what's the, what are the mechanisms to add more operators? Um, so right now it's not permissionless. Uh, right now adding not more, more not operators is uh, uh, done using uh, a governance process when uh, there is a sub governance group that evaluates not operators and whitelists them. And when they are added, uh, we uh, try to flatten the stake so that everyone in uh, in Lido has more or less the same stake. We are working toward more permissionless uh, algorithm, but right now it's not the time to do this uh, because for now, when withdrawals are impossible, there is no forced withdrawals uh, command that uh, can allow staking pools to withdraw from a faulty node operator. Uh, Ethereum is basically hostage with them. Uh, they uh, if they misbehave. Uh, that means that uh, all LIDAR is at risk of the misbehavior. So, uh, and the Ethereum, the other is locked until withdrawals are in. So, that's basically no recourse if something goes wrong with not operator right now. Uh, and um, we uh, need to be very selective. Because right now is not the full-fledged form of Lido that will be able to uh, to deal with uh, not operators that are not up to standard, so we need to select them uh, before when uh, withdrawals are in and uh, SSV is also a major technology. Uh, the secret shared validators when uh, multiple uh, not operators can can share one validator uh, key uh, and not be at fault of a single not operator. We will be able to implement a protocol that uh, allows people to come in without uh, a governance process that is cumbersome and uh, pretty slow and uh, uh, earn they basically they they stake by. Uh, so by can you elaborate well. a little bit on the on the risk here the the risk uh, that um, so the fact that there the withdrawals are not enabled yet presents a risk. Can you elaborate on that? Um, so the risk here is. 
an individual node operator can can misbehave. Uh, they can, uh, for example, turn off turn off the uh, the nodes uh, for whatever reason. For example, because uh, there is data center fire, or they uh, I don't know they, there is government credit down node operators. Well, that that's a tail risk, but it can happen, right? Uh, and uh, if they do, um, they are they will start getting penalties. And these penalties will, uh, instead of staking rewards, will uh, chew up at amount of Ethereum st uh, of Ether staked uh, in Lido. And instead of rewards, we will have penalties for all the Lido. We we will actually uh, make an, uh, uh, a blog post about this with uh, a detailed simulation, uh, which we, we took, like, I think, about one month and a half to do it. It was pretty involved work, um, but like I, I can say that not operators going rogue or uh, being uh, um, um, or malfunctioning or uh, being compromised can be really bad for Lido, especially if uh, uh, if uh, it's compromised and or malicious and uh, um, and is slashed instead of being uh, offline. So I understand um, why um, Lido stakers behaving maliciously is dangerous to all um, staked ETH holders because they are all collectively penalized for this. Um, I mean, this is kind of, it's kind of a problem in all staking protocols, right? And in most staking protocols, um, you, you have mechanisms such as um, each validator or staker needs to put up a bond. And you have decided you have actively decided against this, right? So basically, the the um, the validators um, they're currently trusted, um, and you know if if uh, I mean if they misbehave, um, they lose reputation and they can be ex excluded from the process. But there's no way to penalize them within the protocol. So wh why was this design decision made? Mm, that's. Uh... Uh, that's a very fair question because, like, it wasn't an easy design decision. Um, the reason is uh, mostly the capital efficiency of the protocol. Um, the the reason is uh, I firmly believe that there will be, uh, and mo most of Lida actually does as well, that there will be one winning liquid staking, uh, uh, the way the, the way of liquid staking, because liquid staking is so much better than staking. And uh, the main uh, the main quality liquid staking has is liquidity, and liquidity begets liquidity basically. So there will be uh, one 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 major liquid staking, maybe protocol. It may it might be an exchange. It might be uh, uh, like a, some custodial solution for liquid staking, but it will be one of them. And uh, if uh, uh, the the growth of the protocol is very limited. For example, by by having a lot of bonds, uh, that uh, enough bonds that uh, uh, mm, uh, liquid staking can be made uh, well trustless to an extent. Not not exactly trustless, but like to an extent, right? It maybe can be made more safe on this front. So I understand that liquid um, staking protocols are better the more people participate, but is this actually a strong effect? Because basically the marginal use of each ETH you put in, basically if it's between uh, the second and the third ETH, I totally get it, but but if it's between uh, the 20,000th each ETH and the 20,001st ETH, it's not that big a difference, is it? So LIDA currently holds... Um... Mm, uh, 87% of all liquid staking in Ethereum. That might be attributed to to, uh, to like execution or maybe uh, I, I don't know support from 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 people who participate in Lido or something. But to to only to to, to a small extent, I think like that's exactly the thesis that is playing out. Uh, that uh, liquid staking is uh, is one winner. But do you think it's it's um, it's um, a network effect, or do you think it's just because you know so much ETH is in this that it's now essentially you know vetted and uh, tried for this amount of ETH, so it's the most it's the most secure of all the liquid staking protocols? Uh, isn't it the same thing basically? 
Oh, so basically, I understood liquidity differently. So basically, I under uh, I understood liquidity in the sense of if I want to withdraw my stake, what's the slippage I have to take? That's how I understood liquidity. Is that not how you uh, meant it? That's exactly how I meant it. But that liquidity is is based on trust, like I said, right? People trust stake teeth to hold the bag because they trust the stake teeth to uh, to be withdrawable when uh, when withdrawals are possible. Uh, it's uh, it's exactly that. Like the liquidity of uh, stake, uh, liquid staking token is basically how uh, what what's what's the buy, buy, buy side of this? How many people with how how much capital are ready to buy it and at what discount? And the amount of of capital that is ready to uh, to, to 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 buy uh, your your stake teeth or sell your stake teeth is. Uh, is basically based on how uh, how safe the thing this trade is, uh, how safe the thing the the future for this token is, how uh, usable it is in uh, in 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 trading and staking protocol and exchanges. That's that's exactly the network effect. People use staked it because other people use staked it. So I'd like to come back to uh, just the the governance for a second. We got yeah. sidetracked there, but. Uh, um, so you you mentioned that for now it's a permission process. So validators are added uh, yes. because they're vetted by the community, and you've chosen validators that have a track record. Can you talk about the kind of roadmap towards decentralizing this process or making it more permissionless? And I, I understand there's the LDO token, and perhaps like explain what the role of that token is uh, in this uh, in this process. What what we are focusing right now is uh, right now at, at Lido we are focusing on implementing a good withdrawals protocol. So the uh, making a we we are sp spending our focus at making them um, and designing a more trustless way to onboard not operators. Uh, but it's a secondary priority right now because like pri primary priority is getting ready for when uh, when the merge happens and there is uh, uh, MEV and uh, um, staking and uh, transaction fees in the protocol incoming that is uh, going to change a bit our uh, smart contracts and then withdrawals a bit after that that are pretty hard to make so uh, that's not like our first focus right now uh, so th what what there is is not a, a straight plan that is uh, fully uh, plotted out and uh, ready to execute. What we have right now is a number of design decisions possible to us that we are debating right now. Uh, and the way to have um, more permissionless protocol uh, for not operators uh, after some time, I think that current process of onboarding not operators will serve us well for, for quite some time right now. The the way to to do it is uh, we we have several we basically need to vet not operators about how good they are. We have multiple source of uh, information about that we can use here. One source is uh, the past performance. Uh, we can evaluate the past performance and uh, uh, use it a, as a, as a way to uh, like the not operator who who has been active uh, and uh, uh, was working well for a year is probably. Uh, uh, can 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 be uh, somewhat more trusted than a fresh one. Uh, the other stuff uh, is uh, is boiled down to basically reputation and social trust, which is not really easy to quantify in the protocol, but it can be quantified uh, exactly the same as delegation protocols do it. Uh, like we can we can use uh, uh, stake date holders basically as as a proxy for understanding who's who what the not operator they trust. We can also use bonds uh, eventually for at least for uh, less trusted not operators. So, for example, you can you can come in a protocol with a bond, and uh, uh, eventually, uh, after you get some rep uh, and uh, 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 staking history, you can uh, 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 you can reduce your uh, bond requires bit by bit. So there is a number of uh, of Lego bricks that can be used to to make a, a, a working protocol. I think they all need to emphasize uh, one thing is uh, past performance. The other thing is uh, basically community input, and uh, they need to flatten the stake anyway somewhat. You said that Lido has like 14 node operators, which is less than uh, much less than Cosmos or, or someone. Yeah, that the thing that. Um, Right now, uh, Lido is uh, distributing stake as flat as possible. 
uh, between node operators. Uh, there is no restaking right now, so this as flat as possible is uh, looks like we we get uh, to every node operator to some point, and then what new and they they are filled up until until they get some number of uh, validators. But uh, the gist is the stake should be distributed flat, which uh, does increase the Nakamoto coefficient basically. Uh, we we have more than 15% of uh, Ethereum staked with us with 14 node operators. And uh, for example, exchanges together have about, I don't know, uh, 25, 30%, for example. And they have, certainly they have less node operators between them. It, it seems to me like the the model, the delegate, the, the sort of like this delegated staking model in Ethereum presents some risks for stakers because I, I mean i i'm i don't stake in ethereum uh but i have been staking in cosmos for like a really long time and like my experience there has been that i i change validators you know on a semi-regular basis for whatever reason maybe fees or maybe like you know i've unstaked and i wanted to stake with another validator like there's there's different reasons why you would pick you know, uh, specific validators on on Cosmos, but with Cosmos, if your validator is is um, is acting maliciously or you know is getting slashed for whatever reason, you 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 unplug from that validator. Okay, there's a three week period, but then you you go and move somewhere else, um, and you always have that opportunity to move to another uh, validator. Whereas here, if if your vision of like how delegated staking should happen on Ethereum comes to fruition. Which which you've explained as like there will be one winner, there will be like one big staking pool on Ethereum. Your options are sort of limited. Where if you're if you don't have thirty two ETH and you don't have the technical chops to build, like basically like if you're a customer of Lido because you can benefit from the features that Lido pr proposes, uh, you're sort of stuck there. Like you you can't go to another pool if there is no another pool. And like if that's your only way to stake, then there's no other options for you. Um, so if like validators, um, you know, something happens where validators uh, are being slashed, uh, your options are limited. How, how would you like, wh what's the way around this? And like, is this a fundamental flaw of this, of this model? My answer here is that liquid staking is, is, is inevitable. Uh, the question is how it will be structured. So uh, if you compare liquid staking to uh, delegated staking, and that you say that delegated staking is is more safe i i will agree with you that yes uh it, it it it's less it's more straightforward and more safe though like not not much more in my opinion because there is less principal agent uh problem here so you can choose your 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 node operator in cosmos uh if you use or in the room if you're uh, choosing staking and in lidar you choose uh, for or liquid staking pools you choose a liquid staking pool and they by some algorithm or uh, governance decision, they they choose a non operator, and you 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 have no say in this uh, except they say that protocols uh, does allow to to you. Uh, that is true, and that's not really very much relevant because liquid staking is winning even now. Even in Cosmos, liquid staking is winning with Binance being the top one not operator. And uh, exchanges together, like there is also Kraken and a few, I think, uh, un unnamed not operators. So liquid staking is, is winning even when there is uh, no defined world and uh, with just wallet gardens of uh, of exchanges. And with defined world, especially defined uh, on, on, on Cosmos uh, through IBC and stuff, liquid staking in Cosmos will also uh, win, win the day, and there will be probably one winner. So realistic outcome, and uh, the basically the point where you can uh, uh, apply your efforts to make this world better is to design a better liquid staking protocol that is capable to to have in uh, this first place and still good for the ecosystem. I mean, it's kind of too late for this, but do you think that a better design decision, sort of generally for you know, proof of stake systems would have been for liquid staking to be built into the layer one protocols so that essentially like the layer one protocol 
provides a token uh, when you're staked um, in in in, gov- in uh, validation? Um, so that's uh, uh, that's probably better for the protocol because it's uh, it will be easier to build staking pools on top of this. The protocol can't uh, itself the the protocol like Cosmos or Ethereum or something they can't have uh, they can't decide for themselves the uh, the set of node operators. You can't bake it uh, in in the protocol. The, that that's something that users have to to do uh, either directly or indirectly through the protocol or the custody they use. Uh, so um, there is like the 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 keys for security of uh, liquid staking pools and fungible liquid staking is a selection of of a pool of node operators, and this selection is uh, uh, cannot be baked into base layer. It it should be baked into in, 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 in into an application that uh, that does it. So it boils down to the same question: how the uh, node operator pool is selected uh, that can't be in the base protocol. So the base protocol, all 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 this, uh, it's a good thing to have liquid staking uh, in some form in the base protocol, but you can't use it to circumvent the security of a node operator set problem. Yeah, I, I agree. So um, clearly, there's. Um, a whole host of governance parameters here that have to be set. Um, and for that, you have the Lido DAO with um, the LDO governance token. Um, so can you talk about um, the token and how it was distributed and what kind of parameters um, are governed by the DAO? Uh, yeah, so uh, Lido is a fully upgradable set of smart contracts on Ethereum. So uh, and it's governed by a, a voting based on uh, LDO tokens. So uh, essentially, at this point, uh, LDO govern everything about the protocol, either directly through setting uh, parameters in the current set of smart contracts, or uh, potentially by upgrading to something absolutely new. That was not a light decision, and that's not where we want to end up, uh, for the reason that uh, like. Why we couldn't have a non-upgradable version of uh, of Lido is that when Lido launched, the Ethereum staking protocol was not uh, even fully designed yet, and it, I think it's still not. So it, it it's not uh, it's not certified yet. So the liquid staking protocol built on the staking the protocol of staking on Ethereum also needs to be uh, fully upgradable. When uh, Ethereum staking is uh, a bit ossified, we can. Uh, transform to a model where upgrades are either mm, like more time locked or uh, uh, locked by uh, staked ETH holders, uh, or maybe fully ossified. Uh, that's that's up in the air yet, but uh, the the current state is not long term maintainable. We we don't want to have it uh, for long term. Most decisions that DAO makes these days are more or less operational. Uh, it's the selection of node operators and raising staking limits for them. It's uh, uh, managing the uh, liquidity mining programs and a plethora of uh, one-off uh, initiatives like participating in into grants for the ecosystem or uh, funding legs DAO and, and stuff like that. So uh, the grants program and stuff like that. So um, the one. Uh, exception was the upgrade of smart contract uh, for better security that uh, Lido did in May. So, um, how was the token distributed? The uh, the token uh, was minted in in December, which is initial set of distribution that contained some uh, early DAO members, uh, the uh, blockchain venture funds, and uh, initial node operators. And uh, a couple of angel angels, I think. The team and about thirty-five percent of the token were were held in in DAO treasury, distributed by DAO voting. The initial okay. distribution was uh, fairly. Uh, uh, it, it it is still uh, uh, locked, and the vesting will start in December. So most of this token, like not all of these tokens, are, are locked. Uh, and. Uh, the way we did this uh, was exactly because we uh, we wanted the initial uh, governance setup to be uh, stable and maintainable until uh, the withdrawals are possible. We we okay, uh, I see. Yeah, 
so uh, the the initial governance should be powerful enough and stable enough to guide LIDAR through the uh, this initial period when the when it's not fully formed and uh, vulnerable to governance attacks because it's fully upgradable. Uh, it was again not not an easy decision, but one we made because we thought it would be more secure for for the uh, staking protocol we designed. Cool. Um, so you kind of brushed over this a little bit. Lido just a couple of months ago raised, I believe, seven to seventy two million dollars from VCs, um, right? So, um, so we 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 did a, a round of uh, distributed tokens from uh, from governance to to a number of uh, uh, of funds and people. Uh, the the major of them paradigm. It was uh, not not like not seventy two uh, million dollars. It would, it was a full, a full sum of uh, twenty one thousand and six hundred ETH. So we actually uh, used used Ether as a denominator. Uh, so it happened. Uh, yeah, it happened in May uh, publicly on uh, uh, on governance forum. Uh, we uh, out of like most important names for their paradigm uh, which had been great uh, helping uh, and doing a lot of, uh, in LIDO they are like a proud member of LIDO DAO they contribute a lot uh, shout out to Georgios and Arjun and uh, there are also uh, folks like 3AC and FTX and uh, a lot of Angel that also are very helpful Cool. So twenty one um, thousand yeah. ETH. That's still upwards of um, fifty million dollars, right? So what what are you planning to do with um, that treasury? Um. So uh. So 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 far, it's mostly just sitting there. Uh. Because Lido is actually uh. uh it's uh, It's pretty much in the black like we uh lido has and uh, uh earning about uh 10 others per day right now on, on rewards is it not staked on lido um it's not uh <laughs> and uh, mostly the reason is that it's debated currently on governance if this uh on governance forum if this uh sum should be used as a backstop if something goes wrong with uh with not operators as a cover so if that happens, the, uh, the at least part of it should be uh, like not under the same risks and as LIDO itself. And part of it had been used to to fund LexDAO, uh, but it like it, it it's mostly idle right now. Yes. So you recently launched uh, LIDO for Solana, and I believe it was also Chorus, for Terra. Yeah, the Chorus was a team that spearheaded this. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that and what are the implications here? So we uh, Lido is active on three protocols right now. It's Ethereum, which has been talking about because uh, like the <laughs> the talk went this direction, but it's also active in uh, in Terra and in Solana, and has team working on implementation for uh, Polkadot and Kusama and for Polygon. Um, the uh strategy of the DAO here is to have an independent uh separate uh team to work uh like to slide the work vertically where a separate team works on Lido for for uh Terra for Solana for 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 everything basically. Uh and the reason uh, we go this way instead of concentrating it all in a single development team is to have a diverse and decentralized uh, uh, set of developers for for Lido, which like many DeFi protocols uh, are are struggling to decentralize the development because uh, they have like one product that they they do, and this you can't really decentralize team working on on on, on a single product except in maybe. Like make a DAS in in domain teams, which is not uh, uh, very independent uh, as well. Uh, and Lido can actually cut up its works vertically and have independent teams that have all building business on on different uh, blockchain protocols, uh, building liquid staking for them uh, uh, separately. So uh, Chorus was uh, uh, the team that. Uh, made a proposal on governance form and got a, uh, basically deal with Lido that they built Lido for Solana 
and have a sizable grant in LDO tokens and the revenue share of uh, 20% of uh, LIDAR DAO earnings, uh, treasure earnings on Solana. So that's what they did. They they did very very good job and they are handling the, uh, the Solana liquid staking very well. They are great operationally and technologically and uh, I, I, I love how they're uh, doing this. Yeah, they're a really, really, really great team. Um, yes. Of course, Brian and, and we are all We are all Chorus fans here <laughs> yeah. at Epicenter. <laughs> you're, you're, you're all right to be, yeah. <laughs> so uh, when ETH2 uh, actually happens, right, um, the withdrawal, basically withdrawal guarantees um, that currently set you apart from other protocols, um, they will no longer be as strong. Do you think your economic mode um, is going to um, suffer from that and you won't be able to charge um, fees um, of 10% anymore because anyone might just duplicate your protocol? And because you can always withdraw, um, the, the 10% uh, markup is no longer justifiable. Um, so I don't believe this, uh, what will happen, but like I'm. I'm ready to correct my beliefs if if that actually happens. I think that uh, the 10% cut is actually uh, pretty okay for uh, for making uh, your your stake liquid and having a good uh, secure set of node operators. And the the node operators needs to be paid well as well. So it can't go much beyond like the 5% we are. Uh, Mm, mm, much, much lower than five percent that we are uh, mm, given to not operators. So I think it will be like it. it it's uh, it's a number that will work out. Um, but if I'm wrong, that will we will see in practice, and we will have to uh, the lighter will have to adapt here. Sure, so, sure. So, um, what else will change um, for Lido with Ethereum two, and uh, how does this relate to your roadmap? So, um, the, like w w one thing that is uh, Ethereum two no longer exists. Uh, there is just Ethereum that has execution layer and consensus layer. Uh, so, uh, what happens with merge? Uh, uh, with merge, uh, what happens is that stakers. Uh, including liquid uh, staking users, will start to earn uh, transaction fees and uh, minor extractable value, which uh, will make uh, uh, staking about twice as profitable, I think, uh, than now, and uh, uh, maybe more. And... Uh, uh, that will attract more people to staking. So what 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 changes for uh, for Lida and for all the staking ecosystem, and that will more more money will come there. So Vasily, you're not you're not hopeful for MEV resistant um, DApps. I think that uh, I'm I'm really uh, like in the corner of MEV resistant DApps, but I think that uh, it's a long wait uh, to have them. And uh, we it 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 will be uh, a lot of uh, mm, a lot of time and, until we see the majority of economic activity on uh, MEV resistant apps. That's one thing. And the other is some forms of MEV are probably uh, impossible to remove, like arbitrage between different uh, mm, uh, blockchains and uh, centralized exchanges. Yeah, so basically, I, I I would only call um, those. I mean, uh, that I would just call, you know, arbitration, right? So basically, um, I mean, so basically, that, that's that's completely fine, right? So basically, for me, MEV is value that you can extract because you are in a privileged position in in the form that you are the person who can order transactions. In a block, right? Uh, arbitrage is exactly that. It's it's MEV. So uh, imagine that uh, there is, for example, a, a centralized exchange that is trading in real time, and Ethereum that is uh, uh, has discrete trading intervals of 12, 12 seconds after the merge, 
and uh, yeah. there is uh, this 12 seconds uptick that makes uh, like 3% bump in price of Ether. So in the next block, everyone who is arbitraging will want to buy Ether up on decentralized exchanges, uh, like Uniswap or uh, something. And who uh, whoever buys first will have the juiciest returns. Sure, but I mean that there's that's um, a competition, right? So lots of people can kind of participate in that competition. Yes, whereas, and the miner determines at, who is a winner here. Sure, that 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 is true. So basically, the miner of the next block. Yeah. So basically, you have external app opportunities. I I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Listen. So uh, MEV is uh, like the, uh, the the one that is on the edges between a different uh, uh, different uh, wallet gardens is probably inevitable. The one that is uh, within a like a single uh, big protocol, uh, uh, I think it can be mitigated to an extent, but not uh, not fully. Cool. Before we wrap up, uh, let's maybe just briefly touch on the uh, the Lego program, the the grant uh, program, and what are your what kind of projects you're hoping to attract here? Um, so Lego program is uh, a grants program of uh, Lido. Uh, we have uh, an extremely lightweight uh, grants program. So basically, uh, it's been made to helicopter money for the greater good. Uh, of of Lido and protocol that Lido works with, like uh, we are uh, giving out a number of thank you grants for 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 stuff that uh, just is good for Lido and for the room. Uh, we, for example, uh, funded the work of, of uh, a searcher uh, who is called Pintail on Twitter, uh, who's working on uh, uh, researching the economics of validation on Ethereum. We are using it to fund the uh, the research, the development of stuff that is into ladder. For example, we are right now working with uh, one developer to make a uh, a good data set of uh, or validation history in uh, in Beacon Chain, uh, so we can run analytics over this. And it's been really fascinating, and uh, as well as uh, community uh, related efforts and bit of uh, marketing here and there. So uh, basically, everything that is not very not big enough to be only under uh, full DAO mandate, uh, but uh, is beneficial to to Lido. Cool. Well, we'll uh, we'll link to all of that in the yeah show notes. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, the website for Lido is uh, Lido.fi. Lido.fi, right? Okay, and that's where people can go to start staking. Yes. Okay. Uh, cool. Great. Thank you so thank much you, for Vasily. joining us. Thank you for, for, Th for thank coming Thank you on. for the interesting questions. It was uh, <laughs> a really good talk.